Welcome to Miss Apex Podcast. The title of today's show is Hot and Tired in Qatar. That pun supplied by Richard Groves on Twitter. Hi, I'm your host, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners. So let's be friends. Welcome to the Qatar Race Review. All segments today are restricted to 18 minutes and the conditions are expected to be extreme. So coming up, we will get fairly quickly into all the blaming and the whose fault is is itness. I'm going to pull it off like a plaster and talk about Hamilton and Russell. Is this the time that the gloves are off finally between the Mercedes teammates? Of course, the sprint race was probably the feature of the weekend for once. Max Verstappen wraps up a third world title and Piastri stamps his mark on the Formula One grid. But I need to tell you that we are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind permission of our better halves. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. Usually. Sometimes. Not anymore. Ah, it doesn't matter. Returning to the shed is our tyre whisperer, Matt. Two rumpets. Say, hey, Matt. Two Point two seven five percent. Please don't just yell numbers at me. We've talked about this. Okay, I will explain. That is the margin between Verstappen's fastest lap and his pole position. And for all the people out there in the world who have been saying, all I want is a Formula One race with tires where they can just push, 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 push to the end. Well, congratulations. Today you got your wish. And it was pretty spectacular, I have to admit. I think we make that topic too because what you're talking about is fundamental to the core of of the sport and with Pirelli's contract length in doubt as well and Bridgestone coming in who are unlikely to want to make a high wearing tire you know people need to be careful what they wish for uh yeah and we're also joined by GT Open commentator Chris Stevens how's it going Chris Hey, Spanners, look, today was proof. Mandating extra stops does not equal mega race. I'm so glad because as soon as they said, oh, it's going to be three compulsory stops, I went, if this race is a banger, then we are stuck. <laughs> we are stuck with yeah. uh, multi-stop, forced multi-stop races. I mean, it's one thing when it's natural and you need to because of the tyres, but when they just say, well, you, you just have to, then that takes the tyre the stuff out of the way completely. And yeah, exactly. And we're joined by Agent of Chaos from Denmark, Christian Pedersen. Hey, Christian. Good evening. I'm still. I'm, I'm actually amazed of uh, the method acting behind the Red Bull uh, experience when Max wins. Everyone's like, "Yeah!" Like, mm, and as soon as he turns around, mm. they can't possibly be that excited every <laughs> time exactly. they cross the line. Like, Max, you did. You did it against all the odds. You. have Got a completely expected victory that we all had already. We've already notched up, you know, on the on the bedpost. We've already scratched in another line. But you're right; they do have to go through, and I'm glad they do because it would be horrible if Definitely. they went. Yeah, Definitely. if they just went. Heads well, off, still. All right, Max, bring it in. Uh, half the crew's already packed up. Let's go. They can't do that. Exactly. Okay, I think, guys. Well, in the tradition of just honing down on the thing, everyone is talking about before we get into the meat of the race and all that strategy and all those tires i think we're going to play a game of whose fault is it whose fault is it i mean we have to don't we chris <laughs> it's mandatory i mean like three pit stops yeah so three pit stops uh, mandatory to everyone well in fact no they didn't mandate the amount of pit stops they mandated a maximum stint length which just happened which had us all scrambling around doing our maths uh, at the beginning of the day, so we're like, okay, 18, so that's 18 times sorry, times three. Okay, so that means where's my calculator? Type it into the calculator. That's three laps left over. Will the softs last three laps? And that seems to be the calculation that Mercedes went for with Lewis Hamilton, where they said, okay, let's go for um, softs at the beginning. Let's just get those three or four laps out of the way, because Lewis Hamilton has said that that was the plan, and then do our three hard tyre stints. And I think, Matt, that is what led to should we say, the problems at turn one? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. And this was kind of genius for Mercedes because recall that Perez was actually starting from the pit lane. So they had very much a two-on-one. They had a pincer strategically on Red Bull here. They started Russell on fairly new tires. They started Lewis on absolutely new tires. 
And the plan was going to be, I think, very much to push Max early and make him decide, like, is he going to chase Lewis or is he going to block Russell? And if he doesn't chase Lewis, Lewis puts in four fast laps, pits into clean air on good tires, and he's got an offset strategy for the rest of the race. Russell, meanwhile, can just kick back, relax, make sure no McLarens get round him, and keep himself within distance, because he had a lot of pace today, keep himself in distance of Verstappen. And sooner or later, when those pincers closed at the end of the race, Max and Red Bull were going to have to make some uncomfortable and difficult choices about who they were actually racing. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out like that. So what you're saying is it's impossible to assign blame, and this should just go down as the first ever racing incident. <laughs> exactly. I mean, sometimes, as we discover in life, there are things that happen, and it turns out they're just no one's fault. Right. Well, moving on then, Chris. No, go on, Chris. <laughs> now, the thing is, I mean, we were robbed of the one strategic yes. oh. variable amongst the front runners because, unfortunately, Lewis did not leave sufficient sufficient room at turn one for George Russell and Max Verstappen. And I've seen quite a few takes on this, people trying to blame Russell, which I cannot agree with in any way, shape or form. It's Lewis's responsibility as the car on the outside to leave enough space, regardless of how many cars he's trying to pass in one full swoop, and he failed to do so. I'd argue that uh, I, I totally agree. It's uh, Hamilton's fault, um, as it was Max's fault in Silverstone. The Ooh, same scenario, more or less. It's similar. So let, let's just say it's uh, Hamilton's fault. But I would say if you are a team like Mercedes and you know the drivers talk to each other, and you know one guy is starting on a softer tire, he's going faster. You know the T1 outside is probably where most of the overtakes on this track is done. I would still expect Russell not to push that hard to Hamilton. They almost touch wheels. He should have known he'd be there. But I still agree it's Hamilton's fault. But I would say it's also a little too hard raced for George Russell. I, I would argue that the outside line is not favorable at turn one because we've, we've seen that the rubbered in line is the closer to the apex, the inside line. And the difference between the racing line and off the racing line at this track, because it was a brand spanking new surface. Still is there, most of the overtakes was uh, done, wouldn't you agree? Um, it, it's mean, a struggle. I mean, I think facts. most of the time, if it was done, it was a soft tire versus a medium tire, or a medium tire versus uh, a uh, in, exactly. like, like, like in this case, Chris, it was a but, soft yeah. Yes, like <laughs> in this case, but it's still not. Was he was he really going to nail both drivers around yeah, the Yeah, no, no, hang on. That's, that's, a good, really ambitious. that's a good point, Matt. I... I Probably. I actually don't think it was that ambitious. I think that move was on. He just messed it up. Uh, I would agree with you. And in fact, I'm surprised because we are kind of known as being a bit Mercedes uh, biased, a bit Hamilton biased. Just a fan. And no one yet has taken the opportunity to point out that Max had a very B flat, a very average start here. And this played a part in the chaos because Russell swinging up behind him actually had more pace and went outside and hit his rear wheel actually touched it looked like or almost touched lewis's front wheel as lewis was coming around the pair of them now if we didn't have the contact with russell let's say he gets a terrible start and he's not there i think it's very conceivable that around the outside of turn one lewis hangs on and around the inside of turn two he is gone because we saw how bad the medium tires are in the first lap from the start. They don't warm up. There's lots of understeer. And and yeah, I, I agree with you, Spanners. If that contact hadn't happened, I think it was very believable you'd see Lewis Hamilton leading the race. However, it very much did. And they have come to blows a few times so far this season not necessarily always in wheel to wheel combat of course there was the tripping over each other at spa there have been a few other incidents suzuka um, as well Singapore. yeah yeah suzuka most recently as well and you know uh the, lewis completely held his hands up i know on the radio he said uh oh, taken out by my teammate but once he watched the replays he accepted responsibility they had a nice little moment as well that mercedes um 
posted afterwards where you know Lewis said it wasn't your fault they had a little bro hug as well which is good because that tension seems to have been escalating over the last few races especially while Toto Wolf has been absent from races oh, yeah. for the last few what's he doing few races exactly well he's, he's having surgery knee repair, um, oh, isn't it? yeah oh yeah he's of uh, that yeah. he's of that age you know like we've been talking <laughs> a lot about a hips Matt and how long we've got left with our hips exactly and uh, what I wonder is because basically Jerome D'Ambrosio seems to be the de facto second in charge uh, now. And I know he does have team principal experience from when he was in Formula E with Venturi, but he has kind of been thrown in at the deep end with two world-class drivers seemingly going at each other's throats a little bit more than normal in these last few races. Wasn't it Toto on the on the on the call uh, from yeah, his he Monaco in. apartment yeah. with yeah. the knee up just over <laughs> the Ambrosio? Yeah. All I'm saying is, uh, at the office back at Mercedes after the race, I would say if I was Wolf, that was avoidable, guys. Yes, that is all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So it was so predictable that Hamilton was going to get the better jump because he had the clean side of the track, he had a tire offset, which we saw in the sprint race how good that tyre offset was. So it was predictable that they were going to be alongside each other, but they need some team orders now because even leading down to turn one, they were racing each other so hard. Hamilton moved over to the right in quite an aggressive uh, line. The line Hamilton took only had one aim, and that was to box Russell in behind Verstappen so that it would just be him and Verstappen going into turn one. But he, Hamilton did that and did that to his teammate. Russell then... Which is how he drove as well. Yeah. Well, then Russell moved, moved left anyway and Hamilton had to jump out of the way. And, and you know, Russell was kind of really only still in it because he had the slipstream from Verstappen. I don't think Verstappen had a particularly bad start. But once they got down into turn one, like I, I honestly think had he, Russell had more time and had Hamilton been alongside earlier, because at the point of contact, Hamilton was really far ahead. So Hamilton was even ahead of Verstappen just. So it was rear wheel to front wheel. But the the pace and, and tyre difference that allowed him to get there was so quick. I think if it was less quick, Russell would have chosen to get out of that. And in fact, if you look at his onboard, you can see him soaring at the wheel a little bit as he suddenly realises Hamilton's there. And I think he tries to put a bit more brake pressure in, which is what sees, sees him soaring out the way. And his radio messages early on, I think he thought it was his fault. So I think he thought, oh no, I should have backed out and let him go. And I've tagged him from the rear. And so often when it's from the rear, it's your fault. So I think he thought it was his fault, saw the replay then. And no, he, he had nowhere to go and he didn't have enough time to back out. But I think the old school racers are used to a form of racing, Matt, where when you get like significantly past, say that was on an apex and Verstappen wasn't there. You know, he's he's nearly all the way past Russell. I think he's like, well, the move's done, back out. But Russell just yeah. didn't have the time and he didn't have the space to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think if I could just rephrase it a little bit, I think if Russell had, uh, for, I think it was possible for Russell to have avoided it if he'd started earlier backing out. I'm surprised slightly that Mercedes just pretty much didn't tell him not to fight Lewis on the soft tires because yeah, he's going to be hitting go. after yeah. four or five laps. Your only job really is to be the car behind Verstappen at this point. They should but have, I also, ignore, ignore Lewis, act like he's not there. But they were very clearly racing each other. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, I don't know what was said before the race. Uh, clearly, from a racing point of view, there's no way to go but say, well, yeah, it's it's definitely Lewis's fault. But I don't think... Lewis, again, I'm not convinced Lewis was racing George at that point. I think he was racing Max. And I think that's why right, that's yeah, why that's he said, came yeah. in at that angle, which from his onboard doesn't even, it's not like he turns the wheel 90 degrees and really chops the apex. It wasn't a really super deep turn that he made, but it was just enough. Yeah, and the stewards have said I was gonna say that they're not going to put a penalty like mm. for it and largely because it was a first corner 
of a race like incident uh, where they tend to give a bit of a you know a, a white flag to those um, incidents. But they also said that no one is, was at fault for the big sprint in- incident, right, as and well, which was clearly Ocon's fault. Oh, no, oh, oh, here we go. That's the one that me, my, <laughs> I, I was arguing in the WhatsApp chat in our group chat, and I was arguing with Matt for about an hour, and then I just fell asleep, and then I woke up. At, <laughs> I woke up at four in the morning, like squinty eyed, look at my phone, and him and Brad had carried on for like another hour. Um, so I'm going to say this to, to everyone listening who's not on the WhatsApp group. Of course. Uh, if the race would have been like normal race time, I, I couldn't have read all the WhatsApp There wouldn't have been time. From <laughs> and Matt about this incident. Okay, so let's I luckily see. had four or five hours more to go. Okay, so look, so we won't spend too long on this, but basically uh, Hulkenberg and Ocon are fighting. Ocon goes up the inside of a right-hander, overshoots a little bit. Hulkenberg gets a great cutback, but all that leaves room and time for Perez to move around the outside and, and be on the outside and on the racing line to the next left-hander. Ocon uh, moves over to the right. There's contact with the front of Hulkenberg, spins out, spears Perez off, and that is the end of those two drivers' races. Now, Chris, you said clearly Ocon's fault. Yeah, because he failed to leave room for the two cars alongside him on the way into the corner. He just drifts across the uh, the nose of the two cars alongside him, basically. Okay, so Matt, it seems fairly clear to me that Ocon just moved into a space where there was two drivers. And I know that you're an Ocon fan, so I don't, I, I yeah. don't mind you defending your guy, but how could you possibly defend what is very clearly Ocon just driving across the track and, and clattering into a bunch of cars? Oh, I'm so tempted. So I'm going to briefly say, because I have, I've worked up an analogy for this that I think will oh, make okay. sense to everyone. But before I do that, I'm just going to say that Hulkenberg himself said the following words, I want to blame Ocon but I can't. And I'm just going to say, if a Formula One driver, not a steward now, not the stewards who also didn't blame Ocon for this, but that's another story. Hang on. So can I but just if, point out that this is, uh, Matt, we, this is an argument what? from authority. We don't do that here. We oh, don't. sure you do. No, we, we don't. We don't. all the time. Oh, that's, that's one of us <laughs> arguing, but we don't go, well, the driver in the cockpit <laughs> said this, therefore it's that. Like we've seen well, Hamilton man. cop for things that aren't his fault before. We've seen the okay. stewards get wrong decisions. We so, argued about that because you're talking Albin in Brazil, and I still think that was his fault. Okay, we're not going back to that one. But okay, so argument from authority <laughs> aside, defend Ocon, because look, here's how I, I th- see it is, yeah, even with Hulkenberg trying to get out of the way, he doesn't have to move all the way to the right, and he can't anyway because Perez is there. And I think there's, there's a fundamental misunderstanding that the car on the inside, at, at, on entry is allowed to kind of go all the way to the right until there's a car there. But if a car chooses a line that's in the centre of the track, they can just stay there all day. Like the Rosberg, Austria... Yeah, and, and I would not argue with you about that rule. But what I will say is that I don't think that's what was going on here because I think the pair of them consented to move out to open up the next turn. Perez limited Hulkenberg's movement, but ah, please, so they're can both I use wrong. my clever and Hang on, hang on. I just want to say that you're explaining that both Ocon and Hulkenberg are wrong then. <laughs> Rather than defending Ocon, you're just adding another culprit. But you, where's, what's your analogy, Matt? Okay, so uh, let's say uh, you and I live in the same town, and we decide we're going to go to the pub, the Codswell Up and Turnip Pub together. This sounds like a and long analogy. And we agree analogy. to meet at five o'clock. <laughs> and let's say I get to the pub, and you're not there, so I call you on my phone. And it turns out you have met Kyle, who will always go to a pub whenever he meets anyone, and you've gone to the um, Dung Heap and the Three-Legged Badger. And when I call you, I find this out. Now, it's not my fault, necessarily, that you ran into somebody else and went to a different pub. In fact, I didn't know that until I reached out and made contact with you that there was a third person involved. And this is exactly what I'm saying happened with Ocon. (laughs) He and Hulkenberg agreed to where they were going to go to. Perez shows up late. And the only way Ocon knows Perez is there is when he makes contact with Hulkenberg. And so therefore, it's not his fault. Okay, uh, uh, nurse will nurse will come to to help you in a moment, Christy. I mean, come on, that's pretty good. Nope, <laughs> Christy. Why are you in a pub with Kyle Spence? Right. Okay. Th- that's my first one. My, my the second one is uh, I as you met. I enjoy Ocon as a racing driver because he's um, he's like that spoiled kid who thinks a bit like a Max Verstappen. Actually, they think they 
own the track and that is what makes them really really fast because they just conquer it uh, and that is what is a uh, racing driver basically but what he does in his racing is he steps over a line where this is my track not yours and you can't do that as a racing driver and i think he did that in that corner when that is said and done it's also a racing incident i think there are That's mitigating it. circumstances but if you, if you had to apply blame it's it's simply down to to Ocon moving across the track into a space where a car already existed. Uh, Matt, I'll, I'll come back with a final point. Please don't be like really long or do an analogy analogy or mention pubs or or anything like that. Oh come on, that was so so clever. Reach out, contact. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I just want to make a very simple point about this. We're going to a great deal of effort to solve essentially a contact that was a cut rear tire on a front wing end plate. Most of the damage that happened was because of the tire getting cut, not because Ocon was Botas like trying to bowl the <laughs> both of them out of their way. And I think that anyone watching that back would accept that he had gone about as far as he had planned to before coming back mm. to the next corner. Cool. And so, oh, I get the final word. Um, anything other than blaming Ocon for for engaging his Perez seeking uh, radar. Is but is but he just he heard Perez over his shoulder and went, oh, it's 2018 or whenever it was they were in the Force Indias and just and just went for it. <laughs> Max Verstappen won his third title, and so obviously congratulations to Max Verstappen and Red Bull. But there's no way they listen to Mr. Apex podcast, so instead. May I extend a warm congratulations to any Max Verstappen fans tuning into Missed Apex podcast. It really is like a wonderful thing when you've invested emotionally in a in a driver or a team and you've watched that that journey that rise up because he genuinely had bottleneck points in his career where he could have lost out badly to to Carlos Sainz, he could have failed to get through the Toro Rosso to the Red Bull Junior program. He could have tripped up over any number of really talented drivers that he went up against. Gasly, Albon, uh, and, and I think a real kind of defining battle early on in his career against Ricardo, where he, he just stamped his authority on that team. And, you know, and you can't you can't deny that he changed the way Formula One drivers go racing. And you can debate about whether you like that or not. But he has been a phenomenon in Formula One. So congratulations to, to Max Verstappen fans that have, have seen that journey through those difficult Red Bull years, coming back, fighting against um, uh, and toppling the giant of, of Mercedes. And whilst this season he hasn't really had to pull it all out of the draw, there's very few people that would end up in the position to take this comfortable um, car advantage, yes, but this comfortable world championship, there's not many other drivers who would, would have risen to the top and found themselves in this position. Um, imagine if his old man had gone for the Mercedes junior route and he'd done a year in Formula 2 and then maybe would have got a seat in a Mercedes customer team, he'd probably only just be ending up in a top yeah. tier seat right now. And um, it's it's true what you say about him rising to the, the car he's been given, because look at Sergio Perez today. I've never seen somebody have to fight so hard to score a single point in what is the fastest car. I know he came from pit lane, but he took on three track limits penalties <laughs> and just spent way too long battling with cars that he shouldn't have been anywhere Listen, near. Listen, I'm trying to be magnanimous about Verstappen, <laughs> who's the rival of my favourite driver, and you have to bring it to Perez, my second favourite driver. I, I've, I've suffered enough with that. I will suffer in a Perez segment later, I swear. Uh, but okay. Christian, focusing on, you know... Verstappen, it's been hard to pick out any standout drives, obviously, because, you know, the, the, they've, they've got a Schumacher, Ferrari grip, uh, Hamilton, Mercedes grip on F1 right now. That's the achievement, isn't it? I don't think you need to rave over, say, today that you did anything spectacular today. No, but for instance, um, when we see the greats, there's some clips with uh, Schumacher, there's some clips with Hamilton from their youth. I used to watch Max Verstappen do the karting. Uh, yeah. And every time uh, it sets Max in the standing somewhere, I just watched the races because you just knew you would see something awesome. 
just as you did with Hamilton in GP2 and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's always been there and basically just been in the waiting. But what they are doing right now with the Red Bull team is just amazing. And I think it's um, actually, it's funny that we don't start the entire podcast with just congratulating oh, uh, Max Verstappen. Oh, because that's him. someone's going to, you've just given them YouTube comments to put on. I'm not yeah, going to, I'll just delete but you, them. But you know, but it, also we've known this for like, yeah, what, yeah. four months now? So yes, that's why it's not a surprise. It, yeah, it's not but so, he, is, he is the real deal and he's going to win much more. And it's mm. very, very, very impressive. Now on to Paris. No, Chris. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Chris, you had a point there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just in the context of, of this race and the 18-lap the maximum stint and Verstappen was put in a very good position there because he had lots of lovely fresh tyres to use. And, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but he had the youngest tyres of the sort of the front runners at the very least, which meant that he could run all the way up to lap 17 before he had to make his first the mandatory stops and that kind of set him up very nicely because it meant he could just cruise to the next pit stop and what we ended up seeing was because nobody could run the tires long enough to enter a management phase yeah or, or get the tires to there the point where they were going to start wearing the overcut was king uh in this race and I, I think what played into that as well was because the surface is very new it's still very smooth and fresh it probably isn't as easy to fire up the tire very quickly so you yeah. come out of the pits on a, on a, a new tire and you end up losing time to the cars that have stayed out so because he was then able to extend that first in to the maximum possible length that's just set him up for the entire grand prix now so once that first stop was was done because because piastri had to stop way before the they did. chose and, to stop yeah. him earlier than he needed to and this is yeah. an interesting strategy point you bring up chris and i'm glad because this is where i wanted to to go to next which is i think that the next two big stories you know in my mind are the obviously the the effect of the shorter stints and i wanted to talk about piastri's performance so i think you know we can talk a little bit about uh, how we got to this position but i think everyone's kind of tired of that story, I didn't do that on purpose right now. But yeah, basically there was you know the, some some curbs that were causing problems. We think it's because the 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 frequency of the sound of the tires going over that kind of matched the resonant harmonic frequency of the material and started to make the tires degrade with kind of a latent failure and there was a risk of them exploding. They didn't get a proper chance to test it on the sprint race because there were so many safety cars. Um, but the the, mo the more important thing is that we ended up in this situation where they couldn't run any single tyre, any new tyre, for more than 18 laps. And and just to add a, a small bit of context to that before we get into the race proper, is that because this circuit has undergone so many masses of renovations, it was it is a completely different circuit to what they raced in, in 2021. They were treating it like it was a brand new Grand Prix and not relying on pretty much any of the mm. data they had from the last time that they ran here, uh, not least because the cars are, are entirely different regulations as well. But the fact that this curb has been allowed to be used uh, and that it was only all just finished a couple of weeks ago, right? So it's not like they've had much time to really go in and check the effect of what it's going to have when the cars go running. So the severity of these curbs, the fact that it's such a fast circuit, um, uh, as well, and the uh, the length of these curbs as well. They're really going to spend a lot of time uh, on them as well. For me, this is more of a circuit and approved. I know everybody wants to jump on Pirelli. Just going to add that the curb that you're pointing out is actually FIA approved, and Ambassas says we've tested it. We've never seen this before. But I just want to point out that none of this really is on the circuit. And now that I've done that, I want to spend about 45 minutes explaining resonance, natural resonance, harmonic resonance, and exactly what happened. You ruined your oh, no. chance at a oh, long no. story what has happened? with the pub. The, yeah, yeah, I've muted him in case he comes up with a pub analogy again. Uh, no, no. Let, let, look, I think the point you made at the beginning of the show is the, the most interesting one, Matt, which is yeah. this showed us. I know it seemed like there was a lot happening with pit stops, etc., but... If you could like cut the pit stop out of existence, because no, there was no like super bad pit stops. There was no real drama around the pit stops. If you just cut that out and turn that into one mega length, what you saw was the cars 
pushing throughout a whole stint. This is the first time in a long time where we've seen a race with no tyre saving because it wasn't necessary because there was enough life in that tyre that you pushed it to the 18 lap maximum and then came in and just got another compound. Uh, yeah, in fact, that's what Piastri said after the race. He said that was like doing 57 quality laps and based on the number of oh. drivers dragged off to the med center and people getting sick and having to retire. I'd, I'd agree. It was quite the challenge, especially in this uh, climate. But, I mean, it's Formula One, so shouldn't the drivers be maxed out on all 57 laps in every race? Well. I, I mean, I, I got so tired of that. Oh, I'm cruising. This is Formula One. Everyone should be maxed out. Everyone should be almost fainting when I... the race is finished. What? That is my opinion. What? I know the humidity and uh, Qatar uh, temperatures and mm. stuff like that was uh, a bit too demanding and uh, everyone was surprised. But, I mean... Well, shouldn't it be like that? Well, I'm just now thinking that like, okay, so what did we have? We had Stroll like limp waddling off to the the ambulance in some distress after the race. So Logan Sargent quitting with 15 laps to go, uh, looking visibly distressed. Esteban Ocon throwing up in his helmet in lap 15, which must have been dead grim. And I have to say, still had a great race after that. He had Oscar Piastri just and a on snack. On the floor, yeah. Oscar Piastri just on the floor in the green room. I don't think I've seen Verstappen flop down like that after a race before. So could Alonso. it just be Alonso as well? Yeah, he was on yeah. the floor. Like he he got out of his car and just like stretched. It did like the old man. I said, "I'm done. I'm laying down." Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm not like saying you're watching I TV that. on the couch <laughs> and then you're like, "That's it. I'm stretching out on the couch." That's literally what Alonso. Did. So no, but my point I'm is, just... Christian, I'm not. I know you're not saying you don't you want it, but what we, we we've seen here is we've not actually seen drivers pushing flat out for exactly. 57 laps before, and that's what that looks like. And you saw kind of well, you go, okay, now these are top athletes who are being pushed to extremes that they're actually unused to. So there's no chance for any of them to get bored. And, you know, the first casualty on, on that list was Logan Sargent. But if you run that another 20 laps, you might have lost another five drivers. Yeah, it's entirely possible. And, and what I love about it, like this was also something that Max said after the race, was that because the degradation wasn't there on the tires, Red Bull actually lost one of its biggest advantages. So if you look at the closing margins, they, they weren't that great, even though I think McLaren in the first stint essentially decided they were racing for second and third and not first. And that's mm. why they brought Piastri in when they did. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you take away one of Red Bull's biggest advantages by limiting the stents like that. Mm. So, and there's a few teams that I would argue, like we said this before the start of the race, okay, this is going to suit Piastri, who doesn't quite seem to have... Uh, the same grip as, say, Norris at managing tyres over a Grand Prix length. Uh, McLaren, in general, haven't been too kind on their tyres. Ferrari um, ha have not been kind on their tyres either. And I expected Russell to do relatively better as well. And and I think pretty much all of those played out. We didn't get a chance to see Hamilton versus Russell on race pace. But I'm guessing that this would have been one of the closer um, you know, comparisons that we could have had between the two of them. So what kind of racing do we want, Chris? Is, the, is this the kind of racing we want? Because we've, we've become used to F1 being a, a chess match, whereas this was much yeah. more of a, a two-hour sprint or an hour-and-a-half sprint. So I will just say Formula 1 has never been flat-out racing, no. ever. Uh, there has always been some sort of management. When the uh, turbo uh, the hybrid power units came in and everyone was talking about 100 kilos of fuel, and they were saying, oh, well, they're going to have to be fuel saving like crazy. This is a whole new thing that no one's ever had to do before. I was like, no, they've always been fuel saving. They've always been doing some form of tire management or some form of car management. Uh, for me, it's, it's a totally normal part of any motor race, um, not just Formula One. And I think when you do start adding those kinds of things in there, you start to get more variables that actually makes the racing better. And I think when you just let them go flat out for an hour and a half, you don't end up with as good a race. Uh, well, I think a lot of this goes back to the, um, I know it was Ross Braun, it was Michael Schumacher, that race where he's like, okay, I'm going to need you to do qualifying laps to the end in order to win it. And I think everyone just got the entirely wrong idea about racing because annoyingly, Chris is correct about this. 
management is always an important skill in any race. And tire management is tire management has become the preeminent skill of this uh, racing era. I'm not saying uh, I want uh, races to be now pedal to the metal for 90 minutes, the end. Because I love the strategy. I love uh, the games the games that are in, in Formula One and other series as well. But as Spanner said, the chess part has simply become too big. And I know you can probably win a race faster by going a little low on fuel and theoretically uh, you put things together and then you have a, 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 a shorter uh, time frame, you finish the race distance. I know those things exist, but we should have races like this, especially on a track like Roussel, which is uh, probably the closest with Hungary, uh, we come to a karting track. Hmm. It's full on. It's each corner. You see Russell going down into the T4 uh, or was it T6 doing a, a non-DRS overtaking karting style. And this is what they are all brought up with when you put them in the kart, all the uh, Formula One drivers, everyone, oh, this is the true essence of racing, yada, yada, yada. We should have races like that, hmm. maybe four or five a year, a season that is just full on. I, I agree. I did really enjoy the variety of overtaking we did see the the less non DRS oh sorry more non DRS overtakes uh, which was really great to, to see and proper like you know undercutting each other and swapping and changing rather than just push a button and get a free overtake. Yeah, I think there is a happy medium there, but I, I do want to make the brief point that we did see some divergent tire strategy, not just in terms of compound, but in terms of how many laps left the tires had when they started the race, and that we were able to see that play out, which was which is both entertaining and fun. I think the idea of requiring the drivers to be good at managing the tires, I like that. That's a really challenging skill. Not everyone can have it. But I think it is, as Spanner says, perhaps a bit too big a percentage at the moment. Okay, so I've got two two points here then, is uh, grip and discipline. Okay, so uh, the first thing is, I mean, this track was relatively low grip, especially on the, the sprint race. And that, that, was, that was pretty good. And we saw some genuinely good racing here. I think because the track looks very bland you can kind of go, well, it's not doesn't look like there's much of an atmosphere there. Like the crowd doesn't look very populated. I don't believe the attendance figures and, um, and it's flat. And I think when things, when a track is very flat like that, it can just make it look like, you know, they've just constructed a bit of tarmac in the middle of a desert, but the, the track is, is good. And the, the sand coming across on this Friday and Saturday made things really interesting, which says to me, let's have a formula with less grip. There's too much grip. You don't have to do my groove tires, Matt, but you need to rip the wings off. You need to narrow the tires. Less grip always makes for better racing. You know what? Keep the power the same. Make the cars shorter, narrower, and lighter. And guess what you also lose? Downforce. Have I not been saying this for the last three years? Everyone has. No, I've not no, been this saying this for the last me. four years. You got it from me. You got I'm the only me. one that's ever said it. No, but you know what? Like every, <laughs> everyone says it. Everyone says it. And I don't know why the power to, to downforce and grip ratio just keeps it's going safety, up and up and up. I don't think it's safety. I think it's ego. I think they have to swing the <laughs> biggest lap times around the rest of the Grand Prix world. But if you want better racing... You've, you've got to get rid of, you know, some of the levels of, of grip and you can just have cushions around the side of the track, can't you? Um, so, so Are the, we going to talk about Paris now? No, I've got one more thing to talk about. Ooh, you almost pulled that off, Spanners. Very good. I've got one more, one more thing here with this. So if you had this kind of format where, okay, where the tyre wear is much less of an issue, and I think in reality it's somewhere between what we had today where it's flat out all the time and say, the extreme tyre management that you get at a Singapore Grand Prix one-stop, where it's, you know, it's literally to your detriment if you don't slow four, five, six, seven seconds a lap down and save your tyres to make sure you hit the one-stop and then no one can overtake you because there's wads of uh, downforce and aero wash and you're on a stupid street track. So the, the truth is some probably somewhere in between. But what's interesting is if you had this kind of formula for the last 10 years, the race we've had today and the skills you need, 
Lewis Hamilton probably doesn't thump Bottas like he thumped Bottas. Do you know what I mean? There's there's a, a fundamental change in discipline. Mark Webber probably does a, a hell of a lot better. Kimi Raikkonen extends his career. Chris, whenever when they made the compounds super hard in in 2013, before they changed it after tire gate at Silverstone. Weber was looking pretty strong. Matt, am I imagining? I'm not imagining that. No, you're yeah. not imagining at all. When they yeah. when they destroyed the Red Bull diffuser with tire squirt, it was Weber's game until they swapped back yeah. because of the debacle at Silverstone, which was not Pirelli's fault. Teams were running the tires wrong sides, wrong directions. Yeah, I I think there is a happy medium here, Spanners, and this is what we used to have when races used to be either like a one-stop versus a two-stop or a two-stop versus yeah. a three-stop. Not mandated, just that this is actually the fastest way to run Quote, unquote, a Grand natural. Prix. And yeah. Do we, yeah, do we do we think a two-stop is going to be better than a, a three-stop? And those were the kind of races I, I really yeah. enjoyed for me. That was no, no, the best races. The early era yeah. of the Pirelli days. The best races we've had over the last two or three years have always been that border one, two or border two, three. Yeah, but you can't mandate it because no. today has proved yes, it. Once you, you mandate yes. yeah. Yeah. that you have to stop this many times, what you end up is with these these little pit windows where everybody does their stops and you decrease variety. All I got to say is I can fix your problem. And the problem is how long the pit stops take. Make the pit delta 15 to 18 seconds. How And though? suddenly suddenly you have the kind of racing we're talking about where people who take it all yeah. out of the tire yeah. can go against people who can make it last forever and you get to the end of the race and you're not sure who's going to win. It's easy. Get rid of pit lane speed limits. Pit lane speed exactly. limits are woke. But the thing is, this has all been an issue since the cameraman got struck in um, Nürburgring 2013 when Weber's tire fell off. Uh, and it bounced down the pit lane and hits a cameraman. And so they reduced the pit lane speed limit from, I think, 100Ks to 80Ks or something. That, of course, okay. meant it was it took, took longer to do a pit stop. You'd lose more time, and suddenly it wasn't worth doing pit stops anymore. Ever since then, it has always been a push to do fewer stops. I'm assuming you guys can't hear the bumpers at the moment, because that <laughs> just did I was trying no, to move we on. we can't hear them at all. Right, but, I'm going to do Chris. it again. Nope. Right, I'll give up. No, I, I sorry, I didn't realize you were playing the bumper right that second. But <laughs> I was literally just didn't Chris, hear it. All I was going to say is, Chris, we could just make the pit exit in a different place and cut off more of the lap, and we could solve the problem that way. I did such a zinger segue into that bumper and everything. Right, don't even fix it in post, Steve. Show, show them, show what they did. Uh, right, no. So, Piastri deserves some real props here. I got overexcited. At the at the last race with his uh, qualifying performance and yeah, kind of shown up a little bit in in the race. But here, Christian, I think you know over the course of a weekend, yes, yeah, slightly different circumstances. I think it's hard to deny that he's he's here. He's arrived. He, you, you. I'm not sure if uh, anyone have kids of you guys. So if you have a 14 year old boy, for instance, and yeah. he brings home the most shy kid from his class. That is Piastri, that guy who's in the background. I just, I find him so, uh, I like him so much. I don't know how to exp express it in another way. It's not, uh, it's not sexual, Spanish, and it's not uh, like a physical attraction. It's, I don't think that needed just, clarifying, nor would that, okay, I'm just saying, I'm or would that necessarily be bad? That's all I, that it's just 2023. To... I need, we need to clarify things. Um, his mom is on a high roll with her tweets. And uh, and the way he's just performing must uh, you can see it in Lando's face, it's under his skin. Uh, it is, this yeah. will be the second driver who's his teammate who will most likely win a race before him. This is this is not good news for Lando. Even though I think he, he does it really well uh, in that situation, it's not good news. Chris, your opinion on Piastri, and could we keep it to? I mean, the driving for now, just for for yes. now. We could we can move on later. We'll decide. I'll, I'll stick to the driving. So, first of all, I feel so vindicated because at the start of the season, I'm like, oh, why was everyone so excited about Piastri? He, he's special. He is incredibly special and he is proving that now that he's been given the tools to do so. And, you know, we've been talking about Lewis and George starting to get at each other's throats. The next one that's going to happen is, and it's kind of already brewing a little bit, is going to be Lando and Oscar. Yeah, but hang on. Just to, to I, I 
I wish for that too. I like I like yes. Piastri. But look at even today when the thing where he's been lacking to Norris has been managing the tyres over a Grand Prix distance. Even yes. today, where that was also not a requirement, it's hard to argue that Norris wasn't the faster race day driver. But Lando is the one with the experience. Yeah. It's like when uh, Lewis was paired with Fernando at McLaren, and oftentimes you'd see Fernando come out on top in a race, but not because he was necessarily faster than Lewis. It's because he was more experienced and had to. he was able to deploy that knowledge, uh, much in the same way that Lewis now deploys that knowledge over George. And uh, we are seeing that now with Lando and Oscar as well. And the fact that Oscar has has now come in and, you know, Christian, you were saying that he's going to win a race before Lando. Technically, he's he, he has won. He won the sprint at the weekend. And so he is a race winner before Lando Norris. That is going to absolutely grate him because he knows he lost a front row start for the Grand Prix because he kept breaching track limits. And he knows that he was like a tenth of a second away from the sprint pole as well. And that race would have played out incredibly differently. He would have started on the cleaner side of the grid. He'd have been the one leading into the first corner and Oscar would have been the one dropping back into the pack. And we see again, the difference uh, that was made in the Grand Prix was the fact that Lando had to start further back and he had more ground to make up over Oscar, even when, if they both had the clean line through turn one, avoiding most of the uh, chaos. Lando, finished behind Piastri in both the sprint and the Grand Prix today because of his qualifying performances. And he has held up his hand to those mistakes and he needs to eliminate them because Oscar will give him no margin for error now. And Matt will now lead us into the segment where we subjectively analyse the McLaren drivers based on their attractiveness. Okay, on on on, on with you, Matt, go. And uh, by the way, Christian, no one in the live chat is is buying your protestations at all. Hey, Chris just said Alonso is on top, so I'm not the only one. Right, Greg, jump uh, Yeah, okay, so uh, to, to point us back at something that resembles <laughs> racing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the Norris thing I want to get to in a second. But in terms of the race, let's not forget, McLaren did pit Piastri early and into traffic, and by my very rough calculations... That cost him easily eight seconds. He was only two seconds behind Max when they pitted him, two, two and a half seconds behind Max. So right off the bat, we're looking at a different race if they went full, we're going after Red Bull strategy versus let's protect second place. And the other thing I want to say is that Norris, yeah, was clearly faster. I think he was faster in the sprint and he was faster in the race. In qualifying, it's starting to become a little thing that Piastri is quicker than him. It isn't surprising. Piastri is younger. Younger people have better reflexes. They tend to be quicker at stuff like this. And Piastri absolutely isn't as fast. But I will throw one final barb at McLaren, although I understand why they did it, is that most of the fun in this race was going to be watching I know. Norris mm. try to pass Piastri. And instead, the only entertainment we got was the in and out laps for their last pit stop in which Norris almost but not quite caught him. And then McLaren was like, well, sorry, the fun's over, kids. Bring it home in one piece, which, to be fair, they probably saw the start of the race, so I can't blame them for saying that. I just want to make a little point uh, about McLaren in general, because uh, for the past few years, there's been like this... That Zach Brown is just an American who knows how to sell sponsorship, but he doesn't know how to run a team. And if you look at McLaren, they are 11 points uh, behind. Um, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Well, uh, Chris, 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 Chris. Yes. And uh, they were 104 behind four races ago. Okay. So, I mean, McLaren is doing pretty good. And that is not just because of the drivers. That is uh, the management. That is who is designing the car and all. I, I just think it's a really, really big head off for, for the entire McLaren team. I think it's safe to say they've got the second fastest car at the moment. Def. Um, two double podium finishes in the Grand Prix back to back now uh, as well. It's looking very good for them. What was interesting to me was when they started imposing the team order and saying, Lando, do not attack Oscar. Lando came in with this really jo jovial tone on the radio, like, 
Why would you want to do that? Are you sure? I'm clearly you faster sure? than him. Mm. Uh, just interesting to me the way he has that relationship with his engineer, or seemingly with the uh, with the team, because he normally when this happens, it's a very steadfast. But I'm faster than him. You should let me through. It was uh, Aston Martin. I meant, if not Ferrari. My mistake. Sorry. I mean, Ferrari couldn't even start two whole cars. So why are we talking yeah, about that? Yeah, but them? that gets half the heartbreak out of the way early. I think that was a mercy to the Tifosi. Uh, yeah, if I'm signs, I'm looking at the drivers afterwards and thinking, well, okay, could have been worse races to miss. Um, oh, well, now and now I've distracted myself. <laughs> Thank you very much because I, I I did have a good and clever point to make there. But I'll oh, it's let okay. The next well, I can go. I can I can rescue you. But I've also I've also lost my point. So I think, and I'll just warn everyone, I'm about to play a bumper. I think it's time to move on. Uh, so there was some interesting antics. Uh, I've just got in my notes the Alonso incident just because I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. We see a puff of smoke and you go, well, he's off track. And then the camera focuses back on him again and suddenly he's on track. But, you know, over the course of a weekend, you get used to the camera angles. And I was like, what? What race is this? What what part of the track is he on? And he's on just a completely different road. And just for all his experience in Grand Prix racing, it then like it's like a merging slip road on a motorway, and he just absolutely slings it on track in front of, of Leclerc. Do we know if he got a penalty for that? I think a reprimand. Oh, right, okay. That seems to be the kind of bailout thing at the moment. There's a lot of reprimands going around. Yeah, like the five second penalty. But yeah. what for me the bigger uh, loser there was the fact that we were watching whoever was in front of him rather than Alonso passing Leclerc, which I don't think we ever got a replay uh, of we, for what seemed like a mega move. Uh, but Aston Martin, on the whole, you would say this has to go down as a weekend to to forget because Alonso. No. Was, oh, okay, hang on. Whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> whoa. Whoa. Somebody <laughs> is triggered. <laughs> In the Grand Prix, obviously in the Grand Prix, it looked like at one point uh, Alonso was going to be fighting for third, and he ends up, you know, quite the way Sixth. down. Well, at one point he was ahead of Russell. He was behind only yeah, no, one. No, no, I mean he wound up six. Oh, he wound up six. Alonso did. Yeah, yeah. So if that was the beginning of the season, they'd be wanting to push forward past Piastri, not be clinging on as they go fall back down the grid. And on pace, you go, okay, well that was the fourth or fifth fastest car. So th that and the fact that they were so short on one side of the garage. So that's why I would say overall, right. that is a weekend to forget, Chris. Okay, so I'm just ignoring Stroll at this point, effectively. <laughs> but what I what I should say is I, maybe more was on the table because uh, Alonso did scuff a couple of places there with that off. Um, but maybe would have lost them. Anyway, I'd say this is a better performance from... In, in in terms of the pace from Alonso's side of the garage, and we've seen in recent races, so f for me, I would say that's that's quite good. But I think what this weekend has demonstrably proved is that Stroll is costing them a higher position in the Constructors World Championship, at least two places. And it has never been more evident than this weekend when Stroll, first of all, qualified 1.1 seconds behind Alonso in Friday qualifying, then shoved his instructor, gave one of the best interviews I've ever seen. A trainer, uh, not instructor. Qualifying. That's that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that, instructor, coach, trainer. That, whatever that makes him sound like he's you know he's on a you know an experience corporate yeah, like experience day. Yeah, like he's to have yeah. in, an instructor. But um, to, to me, that that is all the hallmarks of a broken driver who doesn't want to be there anymore. I've got a really strong uh, feeling that Papa Stroll is going to. Uh, cut his losses and uh, pull both himself and Lance out of the team at the end of this year. At the end of Aston, this year? No, yeah, I think so. Because okay. they know, they know. It's done, isn't it? It's that done. They, they, need a better, uh, they need a better driver than Stroll to get that car to where it deserves to be. Alonso is proving what that car is capable of. And there is just too much evidence now that Stroll is holding that team back in the Constructors' Championship. The reason I say at the end of this year as well is because we had a rather timely announcement from Aston Martin about their return to Le Mans. Speaking of reprimands, Christian, a quick one there, but you are on a, a two podcast reprimands now. <laughs> I was just going to second what Chris just said. The, the VEC or LMP uh, program uh, Aston Martin is talking about, that is just, that is where he's going to go. Yeah. And that's going to be a good story. 
Matt. All right. So boy, do I have a few things to say. Like I'm amazed. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I listen to Chris and I think, oh, here's insightful analysis. He knows so much. And then he goes and says stuff like that. I'm like, did he even watch the same race that I saw with my very own peepers here? First of all, when have you ever seen Alonzo have not one, but two massive offs in a single race? And you're going to sit there and tell me that they had a good weekend. That car is very clearly barely drivable. I didn't call and it a even, good weekend. Even, Spanner even said it was someone, one to forget. I think it was too. I think the only thing that saved them was starting so high up and just Alonzo's sheer Alonzo-ness. Secondly, you were right to go at Stroll. He had a terrible Friday. He had a terrible Saturday. But Matt, today, yeah. he was well, he was actually in for points today. Oh. Except for the except for the off tracks and the only and and let's face it, he had some great battles. I'm with triggered. Alcon. I'm triggered. He had some great battles with Gasly. In fact, Gasly had to drive farther off track than I saw Alonso go in order to get round Stroll. It wasn't a bad day today for Stroll. But and Gasly and was to, just me, being a to me, this is interesting because he has been terrible. I would agree with you. He's been absolute terrible. But today's race. I don't know. I saw some things. I, I saw him coming back to where I expected him to be. Okay. How about that? Uh, Not that he was good, but where I expect him to be relative to Alonso. So on on uh, on when it, whenever it was he kicked off at the the trainer. What day was that? Was that Friday? That's Friday. Friday yeah. yeah. So what I, I admit, terrible day for him. Yeah, and I tweeted this. Look, because he when's he the last time he got out of Q one? Isn't it something like five Q one uh, exits in a row? Five races ago. Yeah. Okay. So I I. I tweeted because this the, i knew this was going to happen it's he has bad session <laughs> bad race crashes bad session can't get out of q1 o looks awful in front of you know behind alonso looks completely lost and nowhere and it happens session after session after session and then he has one race that's fine and people turn around and go <gasps> See, what say you now? He's broadly fine recently very recently but look the overall picture is horrifying and you know project stroll is is done because they tried to manage his career they did quite well against vettel they've hugely underestimated alonso or overestimated how well he would do and it's done they can't put him in in the car up against alonso next season because that would be bad for his mental health he's clearly losing it it is not fair on lance stroll they can't do that they they could try and disrupt alonso to quickly get him to fall out with his team which has happened one or ten times before so that's a viable option but then if you get someone stroll level in so he doesn't look bad you have turned what is a q3 car into a q1 car and and i hope you're right chris i hope you're right that they're bailing because this is horrible for everyone it's done yeah uh, i do wonder so well f first of all even when he crashes, it's only because he's so committed to the corner. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> that was Singapore, wasn't it? That, just, <laughs> that shows how good he is. And look, and, exactly. and look, and you get a professional like Mike Crack, who's well respected, and you have to, and he has to wheel out and say, Oh, that that crash shows how committed he is. That's that's not fair on anyone, Christian. And this is I think when you look around, it's not fair on him, it's not fair on the people around him, the people representing him, or the people watching him. But wouldn't you guys say that the 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 Friday stroll was was someone who was under pressure, uh, not just from not being fast in the car? Uh, you wouldn't act like that just not being happy about how you drove. Yeah, there's, one day. There's more to this. I yeah. Think. I mean, yeah, he knows he's probably been given yeah, an exactly. ultimatum uh, yeah. now. I mean, and the fact that Mike Cracks has to defend him like that is the reason why Otmar <laughs> left. Um, okay. uh, as well. The the reason that I think it, they'll end up going to WEC as well, I mean, first of all, it depends if Stroll's just going to pull him out of the Formula One team or if he's going to withdraw from the entire Aston Martin brand altogether. But the thing is, what they can do is they can still keep Lance in a top tier motorsport, go for the world's biggest and most coveted motor race, and <laughs> which he uh, can yeah. win. Yeah, he can he win. He can it, win yeah. that um, with two other really good drivers alongside him, and they save a bit of face. So Pete Shilcox trying to wind me up in the live chat. I think you're being a bit cruel. Give the lad time. He's had a lot of time. He's had a lot of time. He's Pete. still a rookie, Spanners. Yeah. You need to give him time. But how much time have, 
Harris hat. Oh, <laughs> not, oh, oh thank you. Uh, thank you, Gaypad. Uh, not going to let him get away with we're, that. We're out of time. Um, and I actually, <laughs> this has been one of the, I'm looking forward to speaking about Perez because um, he's had a, you know, He's had one of his best races for a while. Oh, the bar is low, but you know that's that's the facts. So he scored a point. Yes. Yeah, so look, you know, rounding off on on Aston Martin, it's um, that they're going to have to keep uh, Alonso happy. So they've obviously given him promises about next season. Aston Martin isn't going to fold overnight. Whatever Lawrence Stroll does, there'll still be an entity called um, Aston Martin in twenty twenty four. But people argued to the death that it was. Be- a coincidence that Lance Stroll and Lawrence Stroll were, you know, were were involved in F1 together, and that Lawrence Stroll is so committed to F1, and it 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 barely matters that his son was the one that he was going to give a race seat to. People really, really argued when we said no, he was only involved in Aston Martin to give his son a race seat. People really argued against that. So if Lance Stroll leaves and Lawrence Stroll isn't in F1 in two years' time as well, we can at least. You know, we can round off that five-year-old argument that wound me up. And rumor has it that uh, Aston Martin is for sale to someone from Saudi Arabia, right? And if Or they China. take over the team, I mean, oh, that's that's the that's the that's the business business, not yeah, not the Formula exactly. One. The Formula One team is different. No, but you know, if Stroll sells the business business, there will be boards and stuff like that. It, I mean, it can go on. All it's right. what, what Chris said, I second that. You I'm, really don't want to get into the business details. I've right got now. a feeling. It's time. All right. So I've been pretty honest about my disappointment uh, at Sergio Perez and how my Sergio Perez fandom his fandom isn't isn't going well. And then you know, and I've been upset with the way he's driven. And I haven't liked the fact that he's hit like six or seven people in the the last two races. And to be honest, as I said on another outlet. I said the thing I wanted for him in Qatar was for something to happen where he couldn't drive because it was just becoming so woeful and painful to watch. And I and will, it came true. He couldn't drive. He couldn't drive. He was well. He was he was barely on the track, was he? So he couldn't hit anyone because yeah. he was barely on the track. Um, he got three violations for pit lane uh, warning. So he got three separate penalties for violating track limits, which does not suggest someone who is comfortable driving around that track. He finishes P10 and a fairly lucky P10. I want to make you feel better. There was actually a driver who got more violations, track limit violations, than Perez. Okay, that would be Gasly. He got seven. Gas- Perez only got six. Gasly so, was so at maniac. least that's something. Yeah, Gasly was a maniac today. So what you're saying is he got slightly less track violations than the maniac of the the race this time, but he didn't hit anyone. So that does represent his best drive for several races. Uh, I, I, there's no redemption now, uh, Christian. It's it's over. Uh, it's 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 yet another thing where I just I really wish Red Bull would have just pulled the plug three or four races ago and just said, look, you know, we're putting Ricardo in. Hand aside, I'm like you, Spanners. Actually, I, I like uh, Sergio Perez. I think he's uh, I think he's a really really good racing driver. I think he's uh, he's really good on tires. Uh, I think he's intelligent. He has some craft. But sometimes you just get into a situation where yeah. that you just can't get out of. And you've seen it before with Formula One teams, with racing teams in general. Sometimes there's just something just doesn't work and you can't get it back on track. And this, I, I'm fairly sure that's what we're seeing right now. So I have a suggestion. If I was Red Bull, I mean, they can't win more this year. They've won it all. So yeah. they could just not show up if they want. <laughs> okay. How about putting uh, Yuki in his car for one race, then the next race, Ricciardo, and then the next race, maybe Lawson. Put Paris in the AlphaTauri, let him race there until the season is finished, because he's not he's not going to make them more points or anything. No. And they can test out their drivers. They can see what's going on. I, maybe he's yeah. back in the car next year, but... Don't, That is what I would do if I was. No, him. don't help help him with contract negotiations because there's a Williams seat, isn't there? I think that's that's the redemption tour now for Perez is to go and get that Williams seat and and just start again and show that go and go and beat Albon uh, at Williams. Bring some cash with you. That I that's like the that. thing now. Don't go to Alpha Towery, but yeah, I think you know pull pull the plug on on the, on the horror show that is. And this is with all the best will in the world. Pull the plug on this horror show. It's it's just awful. It's not going to happen. Why? Because Perez is still second in the drivers' championship. Chris. Okay. 
Okay, so Matt, I hear you. I hear you on this, right? Why change anything when they've got one, two in the championship and the constructors is sorted? But for me, they need to anticipate the fact that next year, Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren could suddenly all be on the same footing as them. Doesn't matter how unlikely that may sound at the moment, they need to prepare for that possibility. And at the moment, Perez will not get them the Constructors' Championship if those other three teams are oh, suddenly on the same fine. footing as them. And that's why I am so goddamn mad that they put Ricardo back in the uh, the Alpha Tauri uh, because at the bare minimum, for me, it should be Ricardo in the Red Bull, put Lawson in the Alpha Tauri alongside Yuki for next year. That's a solid combination. I know the fact that they're all contracted to Red Bull anyway, so the fact that Ricardo's being announced at Alpha Tauri doesn't actually mean anything for now because he could still well end up in the Red Bull next year. Perez does have a contract for next year, but I really, really think they need to make a change there. Well, that's that's no, that doesn't feel very positive. So sorry, it's not. <laughs> it's just it's I, just a fact. Sorry, Do you I, want to be more positive about Stroll as I, well? I thought this was the make spanners feel better about Perez segment. Did, no, did no one get the drivers today? Did terribly, oh, and you should feel bad about that. And Colchester United. Spanners, you are like five eleven <laughs> <laughs> and two thirds. It's almost six. <laughs> And Colchester United lost 3 0 at home to Morecambe. So it's not been a good sporting weekend um, all around for me. Yeah, but that's what happens. That's sport. You don't always get to have your favourite driver win. A quick one on, on Gasly. Like, he was a bit of a, a menace on track, Chris. What, what was going on? What juice had been he been sipping? I've, I've no idea, but he's shoving people off track. He's shoving himself off track to try and get moves done that he knows he's not going to be able to keep. He was just being so wild uh, out there and ended up you know, losing out on points because he's uh, he was another driver to accrue track limits uh, penalties along with um, Albon uh, as well. Funny how uh, all the drivers who took track limits penalties ended up falling outside the points. Yeah. Oh, I've just seen, by the way, on I've just on the Twitter feed. I've just dis- distracted by seeing the onboard camera of Stroll getting out of his car. So that's worth showing because you know you can you can say wrongly, but you can say a lot of the drivers say in the green room they knew they were on camera. You know, Nigel Mansell getting out of his Lotus was it and pushing it across the line and then dramatically falling on the floor. This is feels like much more of a candid shot where it was you know on the onboard. It wasn't wasn't on the broadcast. There was no cameras pointed at him. And you can see him. He tries to get out of the car, realises he's in trouble, rests fully on the front wheel, and then just like looks around, sees an ambulance ahead of him, and just like staggers, goes, up oh, ambulance, that's what I need, and just fully whacks into the ambulance and starts sort of knocking on the knocking on the door. So yeah, the conditions out there were absolutely brutal. It is uh, amazing. It's like when you are it's 3 a.m. You're absolutely drunk off your mind. And you see the taxi that's going to be able to take you home and he just wanders over to it uh, like that, like a homing beacon, right? And uh, the conditions, so extreme. And the fact that we were seeing the constant push laps, the, you know, no, no management, that's why I think that it was uh, a contributing factor to it, not just the conditions, not just the heat, the fact that it is one of the fastest circuits um, out there, probably the most physically demanding race they'll have done all season, even before this, um, you know, constant pushing uh, 18 lap maximum stint length. Luckily, next year's race is in December, should be significantly cooler um, then. But uh, yeah, drivers really were being pushed. Mm. And there was, yeah, there was good racing. So so I think uh, mentioning dispatches, I thought um, Sonoda and Albon, both like trading blows with each other, racing people really well lots of action up and down the the track and and i think like yeah that if we could get somewhere in the middle of this somewhere between flat out making them all pass out and go to the ambulance somewhere somewhere in between that and having to drive eight seconds a lap slower to make sure you only do a one stop that in the middle magic lies and there was something in it as well because Alfa Romeo scored double points, which is very uncharacteristic of them. <laughs> but it was basically because they had all the ties in the world because they were out in Q1. All right, let's move on to the podium.
A hot and sweaty evening in Qatar and a late night here in the UK. So I will get to the podium slightly quicker than usual. I know because in previous shows, in recent shows, we have pushed it very close to the one hour time limit that we set here on Missed Apex Podcast. So today, let's make it nice and comfortable by going to our awards. So we do a good thing uh, and bad thing award. We get to praise and we get to punish Uh, teams, drivers or entities from the comfort of our sheds and our sofas. So let's start with a positive thing. Here's the thing of the weekend. Christian Pedersen, occasionally on social media, but usually running away from it, preferring instead the vagaries and blandness of real life. So we can't recommend that you follow Christian anywhere on social media, but you can give us your award. So who gets your thing of the weekend? It has to be Piastri. I, I think it's uh, that's that's a really good showing. Mm, yeah, I think there's I, very... I don't have any more to say about it because we already talked about him. But uh, it's just I, I just find him uh, very interesting and. Uh, what a very bright future. You can make all the caveats you want about tyre wear and, and safety car luck or, uh, uh, yeah, it, you know, the safety car might have helped him a little bit when it came to that sprint race victory. And obviously some of his competitors on the alternate tyre strategy completely ruled themselves out. So Russell and the Ferraris had absolutely no chance once those softs disintegrated. But what he is doing at the moment is giving us a drumbeat of results. He keeps habitually exactly. putting it Regardless of where Norris is, Piastri is on the podium a bunch. He's on the front row a, a, a couple of times. He's in that top five in qualifying. He is making it hard to ignore him. Chris Stevens. And if I can, oh, yeah, sorry, oh. if I can just add the, the clip with Piastri from, was it in uh, uh, in uh, Austria where they flew? There was some guys flo- flying around the circuit on something that could hold them in the air. And there's like a sequence of Piastri just sitting alone in the garage, looking at the screen while one is just falling from the sky. And the face expression on Piastri there, that is probably my favorite TV moment. What was the expression? It's so difficult to explain. You have to watch it. So I will find the the one you're talking about. Perfect for an audio show. Google it. (laughs) I will try. I can try and do it. You want, to, want me to try and do it? No. This is also I'm good for podcast. No, no, okay. I'm telling the oh, listeners oh. to Google it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to move on to, to Chris Stevens now. But th- sure? But Christian, thanks. You've been you've been a delight. <laughs> no problem, Spanners. You're the opposite, Chris Stevens. You are an thanks. attention um, acceptor. So we can go and follow you at Chris on Racing. And we'll have all That's the me. links to your social media in the show notes below. But for now, who do you think or what do you think or when do you think was your thing of the weekend? Uh, so it, it, kind of similar to Christian, but specifically for me, Piastri's sprint win. Uh, I think it's a real uh, statement of intent for Piastri. The fact that he's come in, he's won something before Norris mm. has. That is the biggest statement that yeah. has been made there. And if there were any doubts about this kid being a future world champion, then they are completely silenced now. I think. Oh, I think that's. I think. I think that's a bit previous, Chris. I think you've got carried away. No, I'm calling it now. All right. Well, there we go. All right, Matt, two rumpets. You are on social media at MattPT55. I'm angry at anyone listening to this who doesn't follow you on social media. So I'm going to put the links in there. I'm going to make it super easy on your device or YouTube. You just go to where the notes are, scroll right or left or whatever, and you just click on the social media platform you're on and you follow Matt now. I'm not I'm not messing around anymore. Well, I appreciate that. And certainly if you're interested in things like the resonance of tires and science and all that good stuff, you will probably find some nice things that I repost or retweet or whatever they call it these, whatever the kids call it these days. I don't know. Do you know what the kids call things these days, Spanners? I have no idea. No, I'm... What's a I'm, meme No, don't. I'm so lost. The Kevin James <laughs> meme came yeah. out and we had to get Christina Lee Mace to explain it to us. And then after explaining it to us and we finally got it, she said, yeah, but it's a week old. Don't use it. Like, oh, can't keep up. All right, Too Matt, late. what's yeah. your thing of the weekend? You know, this is, re- this is really challenging. I mean, my thing of the weekend should simply be, oh, Max won the driver's championship. That was boring. It was, it was weirdly not the event that I wanted it to be, maybe because it was during the sprint race, which is a whole separate conversation. But... You know what my thing is? I'm going to go back to what I said today. 
The thing is seeing a race like this, because I don't think we're ever going to see this again under these regulations or under the next regulations. I think today was an amazing and a special and a one-off thing. And everybody who got to view it should, should be thankful they got to see such a spectacle mm. put on for them. A and driving so in a way, spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. And so in a way, all the weirdnesses that led up to this weekend gave us this one special moment to see, well, what would happen if we gave F1 cars tires and they could just drive as fast as they wanted the whole race? We well, got like, you know. we got a what if, we got a, an actual we like. We really did. This was yeah. an alternate universe, alternate F1 universe. That's what just happened. Okay, cool. It was like the wormhole. We just went right through it. My it turn, my turn. Uh, go and follow okay. me at Spanners Ready and uh, follow me on Instagram. I'm getting better at posting things on there. I had a photograph of me being interviewed at an event and I was smiling and stuff and I thought it was quite... It was quite a nice photo. So if you'd quite if you'd like to see quite a nice photo of me, then follow me on the Instagram, um, Spanners Ready, and on Twitter. That's where I do my main arguing. I'm on Facebook as as well, but I mainly use that for buying cabinets or secondhand game systems. Oh, my thing of the weekend. Look, yeah, we're all waiting on that. <laughs> okay. I, I, I was just thinking that I need a new office cabinet and that might got completely distracted by that thought. Um, so if anyone has an office cabinet to sell me, if you could let me know, Don't. not too high, but, you know, maybe two drawers. Okay, so my thing of the weekend is going to be the FIA. And I don't praise the FIA very often, but there was a problem. It could be a problem of their own doing. I'm not sure. You could argue about the track prep. Christian's giving me the, the, the evil eye. But look, you, you can play the blame game. You can play whose fault is this. But there was a problem and they had to come up with a solution. Otherwise, there was no race car race. And I wanted there to be a race car race. And they came up with a solution. And they came up with it in plenty of time. And they, they not only said, here's our solution, but here's our solution if the tyres last in the sprint race. Here's the solution if they don't last in the sprint race. And then they were unable to make that assessment and then made a proper plan, did all the sheets, uh, let, let everyone know the tyre allocations. Uh, the TV broadcast was on point saying, ah, okay, he, this driver must lap on lap 25. So you could follow it. Without all that information, today would have been random chaos and it would have been on par with rubbish refueling where you never knew what was getting on. So... FIA problem solving, my thing of the weekend. Whoever came up with that solution should be on telly so we can all clap. And can I just add, they also did a pretty good job getting us the track limits violations very rapidly so we weren't sitting around for 45 minutes wondering who actually finished where in the race. Oh my goodness. My Use tech. Use tech to detect where someone... You can already to a high accuracy detects when a car crosses the start finish line it's broadly the same as that and it's not zero money but it's also not you know it's not uh it's not rockstar wages either to get that done you don't have to do it around the whole track just key problem areas and and even if you didn't use that technology there's a thousand examples in this world it's 2023 there is a thousand examples of a system that detects where one thing is relative to another thing Okay, you get a, a bunch of engineers in a room for a day, give them some cucumber sandwiches, and they'll spit out a solution. This isn't hard. The tracks limit stuff is boring now. So just come up with something, Christian. Let's come up with something where a little <laughs> light goes off and says, beep, you did it bad. But actually, it's my, uh, we're going to get to the positive thing, right? No, the negative yeah, thing. Yeah, we can do that. You want to do that now? I'll do that now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, yeah do let's do it now. Here we go. Okay, okay. It, no, 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 there's a whole bumper. Oh, no, you missed the apex. And uh, an eight-year-old, my son does not sound like that anymore. I was like, can you record... Wait, that's your son? Yeah, that's us. <laughs> I, said, I always I, thought it was me that did No, it. no, I said, can you record a new one? He's like, no, I don't want to. Don't want to do it. Because it would just now oh, be... No. Oh, no. You said it in that voice. No, because oh, he'd get no. bored halfway through and go to his room. <laughs> oh, no, well, I'm going to my room. Shut up. All right, so it would be that. Uh, Christian, then, negative thing. What missed the apex for you? Negative is such a, a bad word, but I don't like uh, when you have a sport like uh, Formula One, which is it, it's solely based on having an audience. So when you yeah. have a really like this is a major thing where every second car in every second corner is uh, given a penalty for something. You have to be able to demonstrate it. So uh, we know which tracks more or less this will happen at. You need to put like a, a, a camera in 
each section that is just pointed that doesn't have to be a man camera. It has to be sort of GoPro-ish style that can document it. Besides that, you have to put on the cars like a lamp or something that is activated as soon as it happens. I know that is a bit a more tricky, siren. but still, no, yeah, not exactly like a circus or something. Yeah. Fireworks. <laughs> oh no, yeah. Alonso is ringing. Uh, you just need you need to tell the story. Yeah. You need to narrate the story. You need yeah. to be uh, let it be part of your message, basically. And I I, I, th I know they are working overdrive at uh, the F1 TV uh, camp because there's w a new thing every weekend. But this is one thing that will return, and it's uh, part of the story. So they need to do something about it. I think. I my uh, missed the Apex Award then goes to the FIA for imposing <laughs> this this uh the limit in the first place so okay i, th I think this is controversial because i i do like safety so i do like that they actually erred on the the side of safety because what you don't want is yeah tires exploding routinely and it could cause an accident on the other hand there is an obscene amount of runoff at the qatar grand prix racetrack so if a tire blows it's not going to flip the car the chances are it's going to you know it's, it's going to find some runoff on the vast Majority of that is that they would they would the vast majority of cases would find you know a, a runoff, but why is it that at Monaco they they say right well here's the walls if you hit that wall bad things will happen try not to hit the wall, but here with a curb they couldn't just say we found that that curb is causing damage to the tires you now have that information good luck because they would have just. Kept Driven going on the curb, it. yeah. They would have kept going. We would <laughs> until have had the, tire until the tires went boom, yeah. all over the place. It would have been, yeah, Silverstone 2013. Yeah, all and over everyone there. would go, oh, Pirelli. Yeah, yes. I, I think, I, I think we have well. proved multiple times when it comes to these sorts of things, the teams are like toddlers allowed to decide what mm. they want for dinner. We were and literally talking dessert. about this. With the uh, the whole safety thing, right? Like why you need a minimum weight or why you need the safety mm. regulations. Because otherwise, Formula One designers would make unsafe cars because <laughs> they don't want the compromises. And they'll yeah. do the same with the tyres. Uh, I know, but it just... Okay, so... Okay, well, then that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're managing F1 teams as if they are just teenagers who will go into the yeah. snack cupboard an, an unlimited amount of times despite th that meaning that then ruins their dinner. They're constantly sneaking into your whiskey cabinet. They know where you hid the key. Yeah, that's not. We're not quite at that point yet. But the snack cupboard thing—that was a—that's a real thing. I've drawn from my real life experience. Give it a year, Spanos. Give it a year. <laughs> okay, uh, Chris. Then who missed the apex for you? Uh, you're missing the apex if you're not following me on uh, social media. We did that one. My, we did that. Matt, your my turn. Amazing commentary journey. Uh, but uh, in terms of this weekend then uh, I would say curbs in general. Mm. Just what well, we're on the same topic, really, curbs in general. So you're saying um, the Qatar racetrack for putting uh, very sort of knife-shaped serrated curbs. I mean, they looked very aggressive. So actually, we should say that people in our, our, our private chat didn't believe the official story coming out of the FIA and think that yeah. <laughs> they just made bad curbs and all of this was a face-saving exercise to hide the fact that you know their their curbs were just damaging the tires, they did look very aggressive, Chris. Those those they, curbs. They were incredibly aggressive. Mm -hmm. I don't know specifically which other circuits these curbs are used at, but obviously they are approved by the FIA because otherwise they wouldn't be on a Grand Prix circuit. But there's just been a whole mess there, the whole system that has led to this situation. Mm -hmm. Can I just say as well with um, track limits here? Uh, our race controller, Richard Molden, made a suggestion, which I do not condone. I, I Actually, I want to condemn his suggestion of taping hamsters one car width away from the track edge. <laughs> That's a cool but, idea. Look, you, you say that, right? So on the topic of curbs, why are the curbs wider than the cars? Yeah. Because if you make it narrower than the cars, it's it's a much easier visual <laughs> reference yes. for the drivers to know when they're going outside the track limits. Because I bet yeah. you they're still saying, oh, well, I can't see where the track limits are. Yeah. And if you used hamsters, obviously they're single use. So logistically, yeah. <laughs> very, very How many difficult. times could you reuse the hamster? Oh, no. Yeah. Single use. It's like plastic straws. Got to Got to get rid of them. Matt, who missed the apex for you? Well, you're going to laugh at this. But 
after 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 seeing this today and after after the continuing track limits drama i'm going to say it's this entire regulation set for foolishly adopting 18 inch wheels when 15 or 16 inch would have done fundamentally that compromises what the driver is able to see and their ability to know if they have indeed crossed the limits of the track and if you don't believe me i will just point out they made the grid spots wider because even magical alonzo couldn't know if he was just parked in between the lines or not at the start of the race and i do believe they might be changing it for the next regulation set but we're not there yet yes so they are going to reduce the wheel size supposedly for 2026 in a bid to save weight um but actually now that you've brought up the grid spot um and spanners i hope this isn't oh. what you were about to say but actually missing the apex hulkenberg pulled into the wrong grid spot because Ooh, science yes, was missing did. on the grid like <laughs> there's a big led board with his name on it telling him where to park yeah that's a bit of a gaff that one um but also like signs having that fuel line issue it's hard to believe that there's a fuel line issue that you then can't repair in time for uh for the grand prix and in fact like this is where like this was my old trade was supportability engineering you go you have to look around the the system and go well what faults could we get and and is everything repairable in a certain amount of time so really everything on that f1 car should be repairable within an hour you know that's or, or whatever it is. So that, that's part of the design. So if they fired it up and found a fuel leak and they, they couldn't fix it and they suddenly go, well, that's a five-hour repair, so we've missed the Grand Prix, your availability rating has gone from one to zero all based on on one one failure point. So that's 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 a design problem. I don't know anything about the fuel line in F1 cars, but I would be fascinated to know why that wasn't repairable when they seem to be talking about it like 90 minutes out from from the grid you would think everything would be repairable quicker. I think we've all done our Missed Apex Awards. Please go and click in the social medias and follow us. And can I say a big thank you? I asked for iTunes and Spotify reviews, and we had dozens. And I am so, so grateful for that contribution because it genuinely elevates us in the charts and it increases our visibility and it gives us a warm, fuzzy feeling. So thank you so much. And if you have the chance to leave an iTunes review, we'd be very, very grateful. And uh, seeing as th this might be the last show I do for a while before, you know, back doing commentating again, because that's what I do now. Uh, let me just take the opportunity to uh, just, just huddle in with you, dear listener, once again and say, if you're not subscribed on YouTube, I think we've earned it. You know, <laughs> that was a complicated race we ended up watching today. We've made sense of it for you. I think that earns a subscription and maybe a follow. No, 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 Twitter, don't listen to him. Patreon.com forward slash Mr. Apex. If you think that's we the one your, to go to. If we think but we, while you uh, look at him trying to George Russell this moment. Just while you're at it, just click, the, just, just click, just click. It's right there. And click on the live streams. Uh, we will be keeping you inundated with content. We've got a patron show where we've got a panel of our patrons across a, a variety of fan bases who will be joining us here in the shed so that will be cool we'll have news at the weekend and then we'll get all saddled up again to do this whole thing again for the circuit of the america's grand prix until we see you next work hard be kind and have fun this was missed apex podcast <laughs>